Well, good morning and welcome to Church at Home with Glory Baptist Church in Aiken, Minnesota. I'm glad that you have joined us for worship today. Thanks for stopping in and spending a little bit of your busy weekend with us. A few quick informational items and then some prayer and we will hop into the sermon. First, if you would like the church bulletin, you can find it online, akinchurch.com. And then uh, under media and worship bulletins, you'll find it there. The bulletin's produced every week and it's got calendar items and the weekly call to prayer, the sermon notes, and other items that you may find useful. So if you would like that, go ahead and click through and grab that, uh, download it, print it out, put it on your phone, whatever uh, meets your need there. Uh, in that, as I said, uh, is a call to prayer. It has our family of the week. It has our verse of the week. It's got uh, ongoing prayer concerns within our Glory Church family, as well as in the broader context of our extended church family and on into the world praying for various missionaries across the globe and ministries that we support. Uh, a reminder to continue to pray for our missions agencies and missionaries because uh, COVID-19 has certainly made it difficult at times for us in America. And, and that's been multiplied enormously in places that don't have the resources, the finances, the medical care that we do here in America, uh, particularly in Minnesota, where we really are blessed. We've got a a wonderful local hospital facility. We're a small town, but still God has blessed us with an amazing uh, hospital and staff and doctors and nurses and a facility to take care of us. Well, places across the globe, that's not always the case. And so there's complexity that comes with a uh, pandemic. And so continue to pray for them and, and pray for, for, for people's protection and pray for our missionaries and missions agencies that they would be able to continue to spread the gospel and and find ways to to overcome the challenges that, that will continue to meet people's need and continue to reach people uh, with the good news of Jesus Christ. We continue to pray here in America for the ongoing issues with right, revolving around racial tension that was you know um, set off by the death of George Floyd, but um, there's a lot more to it than just that. And we as Christians need to be accountable to it and loving our neighbor and, and praying for our neighbor and, and realizing that we're all created in God's image. And, and so uh, within that, um, we we'll just encourage you to be a people of prayer, find ways to, to, to serve others as well. Prayer is awesome, but we also need action. And so if you can love somebody who, who needs to be loved, if you can uh, be a friend to somebody, do it. Uh, take that extra step. And, and it doesn't matter what race, be a good neighbor. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love as Christ first loved us. We will love others. And as we do that, and as we love, and as we serve, and as we connect, we can change the world. God has told us that. And so I would encourage you to, to be part of that and to make a difference in this world. And then uh, finally, just if you have prayer requests, you can drop them in the comments during worship. You can send them to us online. Our church webpage has a, f a format for prayer submission. You can email, text message, whatever you got. If you get it to us, we will pray for you. Do indicate if you would like it to be a private prayer request or a public prayer request. If you put it in the comments, we'll know it's a public prayer request and we will pray for you. Uh, if you're watching today and you're watching this on Sunday morning live at 1030, uh, feel free to hop in the comments and say hello to one another. And uh, uh, we uh, look forward to getting back together and gathering. And I'll talk about that here in a little minute following our prayer. But in the meantime, connect with one another uh, online, give each other calls, send each other letters, emails, texts, keep connecting to the body of Christ, uh, because that helps all of us get through this time. Well, I'm going to pray. I encourage you to join me for a moment in prayer, and then I'll talk about uh, our plans for coming back together in physical worship, and then we'll get into the sermon. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for every man, woman, and child even the dogs and cats and the fishes and whoever else might be listening, Lord, wherever this is sent, uh, just pray your blessing upon the time that we have together in your word. Pray, God, for all of the things that are going on in the world, that you would help us uh, be people who might lead well, who might love well, who might serve well, that, God, we might, as your image bearers, uh, continue to show your glory in all that we do. And, God, as image bearers, may we see each other as exactly that, that truly each and every one of us is a wonderful creation loved by you, given value by you. And what a wonderful thing that is. 
Here on Father's Day weekend, Lord, uh, we are reminded of so many great men in our lives. We praise you for them. Praise you for the fathers. And it's not just biological fathers. There's many men who've had a huge impact in so many of our lives. God, we are truly thankful for the men in our lives. Truly thankful for the impact that they have. Lord, we pray for all of the men in our lives, fathers in particular, but all of the men that indeed you would help them to lead well, that you would help them to love others and put others first, to help them guide and, and protect and provide. And God, help them to be men after your own heart as David was. And God, if we do that, if we chase after you, if we put you in the first place in our hearts, first place in our priorities, then the rest will fall into place. And so God, especially we pray on this day that men would pursue you and know you and love you uh, so that truly they may set the path for all who follow behind them. Lord, we are thankful for all of your blessing. Thank you for our church, for our country, for our freedom, for all that you have blessed us with. We are truly humbled and amazed, and they are good gifts from you, our great Father God. Continue to be with us as we continue on in worship. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one last real quick thing, other than happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. I got to spend last week with my dad and my brother and my son on vacation, and uh um, it was great to be with them, and I've had so many great men in my life that uh, have truly been influential, and, and I am appreciative of each and every one of those. And and uh, as I said in my prayer, it's not about biology, it's about men taking responsibility and leading well, and if you're one of those men, we want to praise you and honor you today. Sorry we couldn't be together. Our, our normal, traditional uh, Father's Day Sunday is we have Sundays on Father's Day Sunday here at Glory Baptist Church. We'll have to do ice cream some other time. So I guess I owe you fellas uh, ice cream, or at least our Christian Ed does. Uh, we'll make it up to you someday, sometime down the, down the road here. But speaking of down the road here, our church council met on Thursday night and uh, discussed you know, all the rules, regulations, and, and desires and needs. We had sent out a survey of how people feel about coming back to church. We also called some people who don't have email and online access and tried to gather uh, some general feelings and feedback of, of how it is and when it is people are expecting to come back together. So we filtered all that. We had a, a lengthy discussion. And um, tentatively, we have set the weekend of July 5th as our first Sunday gathering back together physically as the church at Glory Baptist Church in Rural Lake in Minnesota. So you can pencil that in on your calendar. There are things that could change that. The state could change regulations and rules and all sorts of other stuff. But at the moment, we are moving ahead uh, that July 5th will be our first time regathering. Now, regathering is going to look different than the church did before COVID-19. It has to be that way. Whether we like it or not, uh, that doesn't come into the factoring of it has to be different and it will be different. Um, everything from singing and music is going to be different and greeting people is going to be different and we're not going to be able to have coffee and treats in the lobby and we're not going to be able to have a meet and greet time beforehand. And there's going to be a bunch of changes, at least for a little while. But we are working on all of those things so that we can begin to corporately come back together as the body of Christ uh, in one place for worship. Now, of course, the church is not the building. The church is the people of God. And we can be the church wherever we are, loving people, serving people, making much of Jesus. But it is nice to get together. And I am looking forward to seeing all of you hopefully soon. So we will be sending out more information as to what that's going to look like. Um, I believe I will probably create a video introducing all of the kind of changes and requirements and, and what a Sunday morning is going to look like. And so you can look forward to that in the next couple of weeks. We will be sending stuff out to our all of our people who attend our church, not just members, everybody who attends. We're going to try to send a letter out, kind of spelling out some of these things, just to make sure that we're all on the same page and uh, we're all going to move forward together with this. Now, for some of us, that means more sacrifice than others. And that is just the way it's going to have to be. Along with all of this, if you're not comfortable yet, if you don't feel ready yet, maybe you have yourself or somebody in your household who has health issues that 
makes you particularly vulnerable to the COVID-19. That we fully understand and we imply no pressure on anybody to come back. Come back when you are ready. Come back when you are comfortable. We understand there's lots of different levels of comfort and lots of different reasons for that. And that is okay. And so if you're not here, we love you and we will continue having ways for you to worship online as we've been doing throughout so that you will not be left behind. We're working on all those details as well. But we are planning on live streaming our service so that you will be able to see at home what it is we see here. There's going to be a few limitations musically because there's some things we can't stream and uh, that's just the way the law is and there's nothing we can do about that. But uh, we will do our best to give you a fantastic at-home worship experience just as we've been doing so that you can continue on worshiping at home if you're not ready, if you're not comfortable, if there's an underlying reason why you can't come. And on the same note, if you're not feeling well, cough, sniffle, you got a little bit of a fever, stay home. That is our expectation. And we're going to have people self-monitor. Um, that's what we have to do. And so um, just keep all of that in mind and we will be sending out more information in the days and weeks to come. But pencil it on your calendar that that weekend, uh, the 4th of July, July 5th is the Sunday, that we will be able to come back together at Glory Baptist Church for worship. Well, with that, we're going to hop into the book of Genesis. So if you haven't grabbed your Bible, do so, because I'm going to use a whole bunch of scripture today, and you may want to be following along. Thanks for watching. Here comes the sermon. Well, once again this week, we are in the book of Genesis. And as we've been saying for the last couple of weeks, Genesis lays the groundwork. It's the foundation, not only for the next book to come, the book of Exodus, not even only for the rest of the Old Testament, but Genesis really is the foundation for all of the scriptures. Uh, we said that for the first two verses of Genesis, we are in that moment brought face to face with the ultimate reality. Um, that is not the universe, but that God, God is greater than creation that he created. God, God is, is bigger in a sense than the universe, if we can make it about spatial terms and speak metaphorically for a minute. But, but, but God is greater than all of creation. The creator exceeds and supersedes creation. And, and then the remainder of that from there on, uh, from the chapter 1 after verse 2, um, starting in verse 3 to the very end, it goes on to display God's sovereignty and creation and the unfolding story of creation across six days. Now last week we kind of dove in there. We, we surveyed the creation days. We saw a number of different wonderful things as we looked at each of those six days. And if you missed that, would encourage you hop on YouTube or find it here on Facebook or go to our church's website and watch that sermon and get caught up and then maybe uh, come back and watch this one following it. But today we are only going to focus on just one thing and one day. And it's that, that sixth day of creation, day six. The sixth day of creation. Let me read some scripture for you to, to set this up. And it's going to be Genesis 1, 24 through 31. And while numerically that's not a lot of verses, there's a whole lot of words there. And so if you've got your Bible, grab that. We're going to be in Genesis 1, 24 through 31 as our, our primary key verse. And then we're going to look at a bunch of other verses here in a little bit. But again, Genesis 1, 24 through 31. And there we read, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kind livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heaven, and over everything that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed, that is on the face of all the earth, 
and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Now today I want to concentrate on just one thing, and only that one thing. One issue raised from this passage, and that is the idea of what exactly does it mean to be made in the image of God? We're going to come back to the sixth day and we're going to look at the commands that God gave to Adam and Eve when they were created at some other time. We're not going to dig into that portion today. Today, I simply want to look at the issue of the image of God. And you may have heard that phrase before, but if you're like most people, you probably you don't really know what it means or, or how to explain it. But it sounds important, right? So maybe we should study it. Because, in fact, it is important. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? There have been various attempts to define what it means to be made in the image of God. And I want to look at Genesis 1, and, and, and then in particular, four Old Testament passages that speak about man uh, created in God's image, so that we might have a more specific and a more biblically rounded understanding of what it means to be made in God's image. And that's all that I want to try to do today. Let me tell you about the passages we're going to look at in case you're, you're making notes or you're already, you want to look those up and you get your Bible and you want to stick a, a bookmark in those places. These are the passages that I'm primarily going to be looking at. And there's a bunch of different scripture we're going to be looking at today, but these are the, the primary ones I'm going to be using. The first one, of course, I just read Genesis 1, 24 through 31. And, and in that scripture, it speaks of our being made in the image of God, of course. The second passage uh, is, is another one from Genesis, Genesis 5, 1 through 3. The third passage also comes from the book of Genesis, and that's Genesis 9, 6. And, and then the fourth one comes out of the book of Psalms, uh, Psalm 8, 1 through 9. And, and they all talk about the image of God. That, that last one, the, the psalm, doesn't specifically use the phrase the image of God, but it talks about man as, as in the image of God. You know, you'll, you'll see when we get there. But let me be clear as we're going through this that being made in God's image is truly an extraordinary phrase. And the book of Genesis wanted its readers to be shocked by it. Genesis wants you to be shocked by the phrase that man has been created in the image and likeness of God. And as Genesis does that, Genesis wants you to be even maybe a little bit nervous about that assertion. Because making those claims is truly a glorious assertion. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, today I'm going to suggest five things that it means to be made in the image of God from this passage as we look at it today. First of all, it's clear in Genesis 1, 24 and 25 that to be made in the image of God is to be distinct from the animals of creation. We, men and women, mankind, humans, we are distinct from the animals of creation. Look again at Genesis 1, 24 and 25. As you're looking at that, notice there that five different times in there we are told that the beasts of the earth are made how? After their kind, right? After their kind, after their kind, after their kind. But in Genesis 1, 26, and then in 27, we are told that man was made in our image, right? And according to our likeness. And that in his own image and in his own likeness, God had created him, Adam, man. So what is Moses trying to tell you there? He's telling us that man is unique. We're not just another animal. We're not just a higher form of animal. We're an entirely different genus than animal. We are made in the image 
of God. And it's not just that we're smarter than animals. It's not just that we grew legs and we can outrun fish now because of it. We're entirely different. Not just more highly developed. We are a different kind of thing altogether. Today it's not that uncommon for human anthropologists to refer to man as the human animal, so to speak, right? From Moses' perspective, that's a contradiction in turn. We are more than animal, and we are other than animal. We are human. Uh, Nigel Cameron puts it this way, and it's a very shocking kind of way he puts it, but it's, it's true, and, and I like the way he words it. He says, we are the genus of God. That's precisely what Moses wants us to see here in Genesis 1. The second thing that he's, he's showing us or telling us about the image of God is that within that, we are endowed with the capacity to rule. In fact, we're given the responsibility to rule. Man is endowed with the capacity uh, and, and the responsibility of dominion and rule. Look again at Genesis 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule, right? And notice how in, in such close proximity to the assertion that we're made in his image and likeness, God says, let them rule, right? Now, wait a second, Pastor. Didn't you just spend over the last couple of weeks a, a bunch of time convincing us that Genesis starts off by showing us clearly that God is sovereign over everything he rules? Yeah, I, indeed I did. God rules. And as he creates, he rules. He rules over the earth. He rules over the sky. He rules over the sea. He rules over the animals. God rules. And immediately after we're told that man is created in his image, right? What are the first words there? Let them rule. So man is given the capacity for dominion. And that, of course, implies that we are therefore able then to, to think and we're able to act morally and we're able to act with righteousness. And, and that, that aspect of God's image is is stressed in the divine command that is given then to Adam in Genesis 1.28. Look at that passage. In Genesis 1.28, God blesses man, and God says to him, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule. And in that passage again, our capacity and, and our responsibility to rule is stressed. That declaration, by the way, is continued into verses 29 and 30, and then it's repeated later on in Genesis 9, verses 2 and 3, where this passage is reiterated in the time of Noah. And, and that is precisely what is celebrated later on in Psalm 8. Now, if you have your Bibles handy and you're following along, keep your finger here in Genesis, but flip back to Psalm 8 for a moment, because this is precisely what the psalmist is celebrating. Psalm 8, starting in verse 3, it says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You understand that the, the psalmist, what the psalmist is doing here in verses 3 and 4? The psalmist is saying, when you look at the world around us, it, it, it's so big, it's, it's so powerful, it's so intricate, it's so, so beautiful, right? And man is just this tiny little thing in comparison. I mean, what are we in the context of the huge universe, right? And then the psalmist sort of has to almost take a deep breath because he realizes, and look at these words in, in, in verse 5. It says, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly being and crowned him with glory and honor. And then in verse 6 it says, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and all the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. You see what the psalmist is doing? He's saying, 
Isn't it amazing that God in his grace in Genesis 1 gave us the responsibility to rule over all of that? It's amazing, he says. Man has been given the capacity to rule. And let me say very briefly that that a rule over creation is not at all for the purpose of exploitation. A lot of times you hear anti-Christian, you know, kind of environmentalists say that Christianity is responsible for, you know, all sorts of problems, uh, the pollution and, you know, the pollution across the history of the world. And, and uh, Christians, oh, they teach that, 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 you know, man can just use the world however he wants and or the trash the place, right, and just, you know, whatever. But that's not true. God has given man the responsibility to rule over the earth. But in accountability to whom? We're accountable to God within that rule. We rule not as the owners, but as stewards. Our landlord will one day call us to account for how we handle things here. And therefore, the earth is not simply for us to use as we wish, but we are to utilize the earth and and, and rule it in such a way to bring pleasure to the one who owns it. And so we have to answer to those who say, we we, we can respond to those who might claim that our Christian view just basically disregards the earth and that we are not supposed to be stewards of it or, or however they might put it. No, ours is not the place to exploit creation. Ours is the place to caretake and and to take care of it as we've been blessed with it so that it will be a blessing of praise and glory back to God. Back to Genesis. The third thing that we see in this passage in Genesis that being created in the image of God means is, is that as we are created in the image of God, we bear certain attributes of God. To be in the image of God is to bear some of his attributes. Now let me give you an example of that. Turn to Genesis 5. That's the second passage that I mentioned to you. In Genesis 5, the only other place, it's this, this portion of, of Genesis 5 is the only other place in all of the book of Genesis with the exception of Genesis 9 that it speaks of the image and likeness. And look what it says there, Genesis 5, beginning of verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he created him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his own image and named him Seth. Now there in that passage are are correlated two things. First, the language of our being created in the likeness of God, and then the language of Seth, Adam's son. Being created in the, the image and the likeness of his father. What do we learn from that? Well, it is made clear by this analogy in Genesis 5 that that as Seth was in the likeness of the image of Adam, so we are in the likeness and the image of God. Now, the specific attributes are not spelled out there in so many words, but there are indications, especially across Genesis 1 and 2, uh, of what it means to be bearing certain portions of the attributes of God. And let me just give you three of those quickly. It's apparent from Genesis 1 that as God is rational, so we as humans are rational. This is implicit in Genesis 1.1 all the way through 25, where, where, where God is seen to be rational. That is, he has intelligence, right? He has a, a will. He's able to form plans and then execute them. He's rational. Man, too, is endowed with rationality, with, with knowledge and with understanding. And it's seen in Adam's naming in the, of the animals as, as a, a single example. In Genesis 2, 19 through 20, Adam names the animals. And that's not only an exercise of rule, it's an exercise of rationality, of understanding, as Adam gives to the animals appropriate names for the various animals. 
And then this is confirmed later on in the New Testament teaching about salvation. And in Colossians 3, 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul indicates that the, the aspect of the image is restored in our redemption. Listen to what Paul says. He says, do not lie with one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So in salvation, we are being renewed with a true knowledge of the one who created. And of course, this knowledge, this rationality, includes the fact that, that we as mankind are inescapably aware of, of the fact that there is a God and that there is a law that God has given that's been written on our hearts. Man's rationality is reflected in our rules. Our understanding itself is because it's been bestowed to us by God. And this image of God in man is the very, very basis for our evangelism. As I thought through this this week and I, I read a commentary, that thought just struck me so clearly and so amazingly that this being created in the image of God is truly the basis of why we share our faith, why we evangelize. There's no one that we can speak to, that we can tell about Jesus, that we can tell the good news of the gospel to. There's no one that we can speak who, who, can, who can say that they have no concept of who God is. They may not know our concept of God, but it's been written upon their heart since the time of creation. And, and there's no one who can say that they have no whatsoever concept. That, that, that's simply not possible. People will try to deny that, but it's there in each and every one of us. And every man and every woman who's ever been brought into this world, God has impressed into their hearts his love and his law. And those who deny that are simply just repressing that reality. So when we engage evangelistically, when we go and to speak to somebody about God, even if they don't know the God of the Bible, and they haven't studied the book of Genesis or read the book of John or whatever, still imprinted on their heart, even if they deny it, it's still there, the imprint of God. So there's already something there, a basis for which we can begin to share our faith with them. Now we also learn in this passage another attribute of God that, that man shares. And it's that, that God is personal, or that God is relational. So that we too as mankind, we are personal or relational. Isn't it interesting in Genesis 1.26 that God says, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness and let them rule. It's interesting phraseology. And it goes on in verse 27 to say, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him female and male, or male and female. He created them. And it seems that then that God creating as male and female is reflective of the fact that God is personal. That God, the triune God, is eternally in personal fellowship. And so also then as man, as we are created as personal beings, as males and females. God has created us to be in a relationship and to be complementary. And we need one another. And so the very differentiation, whether it's man or woman, maleness or femaleness, is, is simply a way in which God stresses the personalness of ourselves as human beings being created in his image and likeness. We also learn in this passage, as we read through on this, that God is moral. And if God is moral, then we too are moral creatures. In Genesis 1.31, God pronounces everything that he has made to be very good. And it's clear that he is acting in righteousness in all that he does. Man too, mankind, humans. We've been endowed with righteousness and holiness as well. And he is 
He, he's given things that, that we as humans, we've been given these things in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 that we're supposed to do. And we're supposed to do righteously. We're supposed to do these tasks that God has given to mankind in a righteous way, in a way that honors God, in a way that our hearts are aligned with Him. And that's holiness. We are to have a holiness as we live out our lives in relationship and as we live out as image bearers of God. Paul talks about this in the New Testament, about this idea. Um, Paul talks about our recreation in Christ in moral terms. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 4.24. Paul says, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And so as God recreates us in Christ, he restores that original righteousness and holiness with which we were first originally created. That's, of course, an active aspect of the image of God. And frankly, the more sinful that we are, the less we reflect that image of God. The more sinful that we are, in other words, the less human we are. Some people will often say things like, you know, to err is human, right? I'm sure I've probably said that at some point. Or, or, or they say things like, or, or oh, I'm just sinful, I'm just human, right? And, and we understand what it is that they're saying. And I'm not wanting to be picky about that phrase. I, I don't want to keep anybody from saying that or, or whatever. I don't want anybody to feel bad about saying that. But I'm saying that hidden inside of that phrase, that, that to err is to human, or yeah, yeah you know, we're, I'm human, so I sin, right? Hidden inside of those ideas in that phrase is the assumption that it is of the, the essence of humanity to be sinful. That's not true according to the Bible. The more we sin, the less human we are. Satan would like us to say and, and to believe that the delights of this life, the things that we enjoy some things that tend often to be sinful, those things which God has forbidden, um, that he wants us to believe those things can make us more human. But that's wrong. The delights of life have all been given to us by God within the constraint of his command. Everything outside of those things that God has given us is, is then, of course, self-destruction. And so in that, sin dehumanizes us and it progressively eradicates the image of God within us. Grace, grace always grows that image in us. The nice thing I want you to see here in this passage is this passage shows us that, that man's life is sacred because of the image of God. You'll turn with me quickly to Genesis 9.6. You'll be able to see this there pretty quickly. In Genesis 9, 6, we are taught that man's life is sacred because the image of God is in him. There we read, uh, starting actually in verse 5, um, and for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Notice the argument there. We are told that it is precisely because man is created in God's image that, that capital punishment is required for capital crimes. Now this isn't an argument, and don't go down that rabbit trail here, of capital punishment and all those other things. That's for some other sermon for some other time. But basically here, God is saying to Noah that I take life so seriously that if you unlawfully take the life of another human being, you must forfeit your own life in order to uphold the sacredness of human life. And I want you to note that the argument of the Lord to Noah is not that, that capital punishment is a deterrent to crime. Again, 
I don't want to go down that path. His argument simply is capital punishment is necessary for upholding God's standard of the value of life. And so when you start saying that human life is, that one life's not worth another human life, you're, you're inherently devaluing human life. You're saying that, that it's worth less than what God originally created it as. And interestingly, this passage, it also shows that the image of God was not completely lost at the fall. And it is from this and in this that we see in this command the only adequate basis for the establishment of basic human rights and mutual respect. I believe this to my core, and let me say that I don't think there is any other view but the Christian view, uh, the Christian view of man, in which can, can protect against the ideas of, of racism or wicked nationalism. Only the biblical view of man can protect you against those things. Without Christianity, you condemn yourself logically to the crassest and, and the meanest forms uh, of the worst possible things, of, of racism and nationalism and all sorts of other things that are, that are divisive and pit one against another because it sees the other as not fully or not at all created in the image of God. And without God, you have no basis for morality. It's all personal. It's all subjective. It's all self-serving. And so we as Christians need to hold true and hold fast to that truth. That, that the Bible grounds us and gives us a, a view that we are created in the image of God. And finally and last, the image of God means that we are endowed with an, with an immoral, I can't speak, we are endowed with an immortal spiritual aspect to our being. Quickly turn to Genesis 2.7. There we are told that we have a spiritual aspect to our being. There it says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Adam is endowed with a soul, with a, a spirit, right? He has an aspect to his being which is personal and spiritual and immortal. It will go on and on and on. And that is actually part of the image of God. That we as mankind go on forever. Personal, self-conscious in knowledge and in thought and in action. And that is precisely why it's so important for us, whenever we can, to preach the gospel. For if we deny God in this life, that immortal, self-conscious aspect of our being doesn't cease to exist. And it goes on eternally. And if it goes on without knowing God, it goes on apart from God, eternally. Becoming less human but never being extinguished because it's immortal. And, and that is a fate that truly we would wish upon no one. And that only the gospel through Jesus Christ can save us. That is what it means to be created in the image and the likeness of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word, for your scriptures, for the truths that we find there. And God, we're just amazed that even in a sermon like today and just looking at one day of creation, there's probably five, six, seven, eight, ten different sermons in there. We could go all sorts of directions with it. But God, today you just guide us, I pray, to see that we were created in your image and that humbly we would acknowledge what that means, that you love us uniquely and that in that you have blessed us and you have special work for us, and that some of that goes on for all of eternity. And God, I just pray that each and every person hearing my voice today would understand the implications of that, the eternality of it, the, the immortal portion of our being as being created in your image. And God, that means that each and every one of us have a choice. Uh, what is it we are going to believe? Are we going to believe that you created it all? that you superseded it all, that you are greater than it all, 
And then that within that, you sent your son Jesus to live, to die, to rise again, to conquer sin and death in the grave, so that we might be freed from our sin and come back into relationship with you. God, I, I just pray that everyone here today listening would know that truth. And God, I just pray that any who have not made that choice, that decision to take that step of faith, to put their hope and trust in you, even in this moment, even as if they have doubts, Lord, that even despite those doubts, they would lean towards you, that they would trust in you, and that they would seek to know more, that they would ask to know more, whether it's of me or somebody else in their life, Lord, guide them, that they might grow in knowledge and come to know and love and serve you all of the rest of the days of their lives. God, again, we're so thankful for your love. We're thankful for the beauty of your creation, for all that you have bestowed upon us. We are humbled and amazed that you entrusted it to us. And God, may we continue to be good stewards of it. And as we do that, may we see each and every one of us as created in your image. May we love others as you loved us first, far beyond we love ourselves. And God, in that, may we point everyone to you and give you all the glory. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' high and holy and beautiful name we pray. Amen. Well, once again, we are so thankful that you would spend a little bit of time this weekend with us here at Glory Baptist Church. And if there's a way that we can love you, serve you, bless you, pray for you, let us know, because we would delight in being able to do so. If you haven't found us online, uh, go back and watch the past sermons. We're in the book of Genesis for a while here. And you'll be able to follow along on the church's website or on the YouTube page. Or if you dig around a little bit, you'll find them all on Facebook as well. And, and would encourage you, plug in, uh, follow along, be part of it. Because God is going to continue building and building and building. And I'm excited for the weeks we have to come. I hope you are too. Well, again, thanks for stopping by. Hope to see you soon. Wash your hands frequently, make much of Jesus always, and stay awesome. Go and serve your king, and God bless.